God bless you as you give. And uh, if you take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 1, I'm doing three sermons out of Revelation uh, chapter 1 in the next three Sunday nights. And so you'll know not to come the next two weeks if you don't want to hear them. And uh, if you want to hear them, you might tell somebody else about it. They might want to come. But I believe I've got a great sermon for you tonight. And, and uh, a lot of people think that studying the book of Revelation is, uh, is kind of divisive or people tell all, all kinds of things about it. But this is uh, from John, the revelation of St. John, uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ given through John by the Lord himself, Jesus revealing himself uh, in, in and through John, the revelator. So uh, we pick up first and we just want to read verses 1 to 3. Uh, do, I have a, do I have a PowerPoint back there? There's no PowerPoint. You're kidding me. What? Four slides. There should be scriptures too. No scriptures. Okay, it's okay. Uh, things happen when I'm around anything electronic, but you're going to have to use your Bibles tonight, guys. So I was going to tell you that I'm going to be uh, reading scriptures off the screen, but I guess I'm not uh, because I'm going to be going fast. So it'll take me a minute to flip to my Bible because I thought they were in a PowerPoint. And uh, so when you see Pastor Zach uh, shake, shake his head because he's the only guy who knows how to do it, and something happened. It might have been the computer, though. Pastor Brian, did you touch the computer this morning? All right, let's, let's read. The revelation, I'm reading King James, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Jesus, help me speak this truth and uh, help me, Lord, uh, uh, minister from your word tonight, God, and, and the truth to inspire us to be about your fa the Father's business of winning souls and of, uh, of, of not only being a witness with our words, but with the, the life that we live to walk carefully and keep ourselves pure. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Four quick things, the first one being the central character of this book, who is none other than Jesus Christ. We see in verse 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ. He is the hero of the Bible. And if you read this book, uh, the book of Revelation, without learning more of Jesus, falling more in love with Jesus, knowing Jesus more, then you've missed the point of the book. The word revelation means to unveil, to uncover picture an artist and you got the city officials there and they have announced this beautiful sculpture and it's covered up with a cloth and the city officials are there and they're waiting for the moment of unveiling and they unveil and now before your eyes you see this uh, beautiful uh, 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 behind this curtain or behind this uh, a cloth uh, you see this beautiful sculpture that the art has done that the artist has has presented so here's the thing Jesus is not to be hidden. He is not to be veiled at this time. He is, he is unveiling. He is uncovering so that we might see Jesus. It's not to obscure the Lord Jesus that this, that this book is written. The book isn't written to obscure him, but to reveal Jesus. Jesus is the one revealed and also the one doing the revealing, as in verse 1 says. And Jesus is the one that we need to pursue as we read this book and that we need to be driven toward to not only share but to know and fall in love with. He's revealing himself from the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit, and the angel, through John to us, Jesus is revealing himself. He came the first time. He came with his glory veiled. And when he comes again, when we're looking at that day, the Bible says his glory will be unveiled, unveiled. It'll be revealed. Now look forward to the time. In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verse uh, 16 and, uh, 15 and 16, uh, it, there's a great scripture there. 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says this, which in times he shall know who is the blessed and only potentate, talking about the power of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, 
whom no man has seen, no, nor can see, to him be honor and power and everla everlasting amen. Uh, Paul writes to Timothy, giving praise to God and charging, and, 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 and it says, which in his times he shall show. In other words, in that time he's going to show, it's going to be unveiled, and you're going to see the power and the glory of the King of Kings. The book of Revelation was given to us to unveil the full glory of God. And when he comes again, we're going to see his glory. He came the first time to be crucified. He comes the next time to be, to be crowned. For his coronation. He came the first time to a tree. He comes the next time to his throne. He comes the first time and Pilate judged him. He comes the next time and he will judge Pilate. He, come, he came the first time and put, to, put, 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 took upon himself uh, a man and, and went to the cross in shame and was shamed before people. But when he comes again, he's coming in great splendor. He came to redeem the first time, but he's coming to reign when he comes again. He came as the suffering servant the first time he came to this earth. But when he comes again in the clouds of glory, he's coming as the supreme sovereign God, King of kings and Lord of lords. So Revelation is to unveil this Jesus Christ. As you see him pictured in Revelation chapter 1, you'll see more of what Jesus is like. He's the central character of the book. We must know both sides of Jesus. He's Savior, He's Sovereign. He's Redeemer, but He's Ruler. He's a Justifier, but He's the Judge. And the purpose of the book is to reveal Jesus, who's the central character of this revelation. Some people want to study prophecy. They want to study end times events and watch the signs and keep an eye on the end time schedule. But they fail to love Jesus. See, they, 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 they know all the facts. They know all the prophecies, but they really don't know Jesus. They know the schedules. They watch the schedule. They look for the signals. They look for the signs. It's like the train man with the train. He has all the schedules memorized. Day by day, they come by. But there's a woman at the train there, and she knows not the schedule, but she knows the next train is her man coming in. And she's looking for him, but she's in love, and she's watching, and she's waiting, and all she has her eyes upon is the man. And we need to have our eyes upon Jesus and not all the surrounding things because so many people that love prophecy don't love Jesus, and that really is a shame. It's a shame, and it shouldn't be. If you read the book of Revelation without finding Jesus, falling in love with Jesus, then you've missed the whole point. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of the full glory of Jesus. So the central character and the hero of this book, Revelation, and the whole book actually pointing from A to Z, is Jesus Christ, God's Son. And the uh, second point is the clear purpose of the book, the clear purpose. Again, in verse 1, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him, look at this, here's the purpose, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. To show things that shortly should come to pass. And so uh, he, notice he says to show his servants the future. Only God knows the future. All right? You don't know and I don't know. And those he chooses to let know part of, of the future, he reveals and opens our eyes and, uh, and, and lets us see. And um, so Satan doesn't know the future. Do you know that? He's, he's out of it. Fortune tellers don't know the future. Only God knows the future. The word servants here means bond slave. Bond slave. You know, if you want to understand this revelation, if you're not his bond slave, this book is not for you. You're reading someone else's mail. It, it is great to be a bond slave when your master is Jesus Christ because you don't have to worry. When your master is Jesus, he's, he's you know, you, you don't have to worry about your food, your clothing, your shelter. When your master is Jesus, you don't have to worry about your health insurance. You don't have to worry about death insurance. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, always present everywhere. And, 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 and uh, so you, you don't, he, he's everything. You don't need a genie in a bottle. You got Jesus. Our future is, is better than Aladdin's future or any other genie, right? So there's a, there's a greater freedom of being a slave to Jesus Christ than anywhere else because he's the best slave you can have and he's going to treat you with kindness and mercy and provide for you and take care of you. Who wouldn't want to surrender to Jesus Christ, the Lord, the ruler, the King of kings? 
we're in a good place when we're there. Bond servants, servants of Jesus, bond slaves. There are two thoughts about the future that he shares to us as his bond servants. The one, number one is sureness of the prophecy, and number two is the nearness of the prophecy. It's sure and it's near. In verse one, uh, it says, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And, and, uh, and so uh, God, God, the Bible says, cannot lie. He doesn't lie. And just as sure as God fulfilled the literal prophecies of Jesus' first coming of his birth in details, he's going to fulfill the second coming in details. It's going to happen just like he said. And some people, uh, some people will not likely believe in the miraculous events to come in the near future. They're not going to be just like they didn't in the day when Jesus was born. They just, they miss him. And uh, some in the days of old uh, didn't believe in a literal sense. And uh, the literal sense that just like Micah prophesied, he would be born in Bethlehem. Like it was prophesied, Isaiah would be born of a virgin. You know, God gave literal, specific prophecies. And it's the same way for the second time he's coming back. And it's coming again. It's going to come to pass. And uh, it must, it will happen. And there's a sureness of the prophecy. He, God, when he says it, it takes place. And, you know, the Bible says uh, in a couple of different places, when such a time when they say, well, where is this coming? And they're, they're going to be scoffing and mocking. He's going to show up. So just get ready. It's a sign that it's coming near. The nearness, it, the word shortly, you know, it, it, the, words, the words are, uh, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. That word is quickly, in a moment, in a twinkling, in a flash. It's not talking about uh, like uh, next year or in another month or in five years. Uh, it's, it's, it's speaking of it'll happen fast, it'll be rapidly, it'll be sudden. And as we're looking at the clear purpose of the book, not only to reveal to us the sureness and nearness of his coming, uh, but also, we're going to take a look at, at the, uh, the idea of how does God reveal the future to his servants? How does he show us the future? Well, look at that verse again in verse 1. And he sent and signified it by his angels unto his servant John. He made it known by sending his angels to his servant John. Uh, it, the NIV is missing something here. The word signified, there's something about that. In other words, with signs. He's going to give us signs of it coming. He's going to show us, see the first four letters of signified is the word sign. And the book, this book of Revelation is filled with signs and symbols. All kinds of symbolism is found. And, uh, and understand that these symbols uh, are important to understand, to understand the rest of of the Bible. And you, by the way, you understand the signs and the symbols by the rest of the Bible. The Bible interprets the Bible. As you read the rest of Revelation, as you look at the Old Testament, the best commentary on this book of Revelation is the rest of the Bible. And, uh, and so you'll see many of the symbols explained in different places of the Bible. Do we interpret the Bible literally or do we interpret the, this book, Revelation rather, symbolically or literally? Both. It's both. Symbolically, you interpret, interpret this scripture. We must understand the symbolism to get to the literal truth. They're not contradictory. For example, in Reven, Revelation 12, it describes Satan as a red dragon. It talks about him, and he says he's, he's with seven heads and a tail big enough to knock a third of the stars out of heaven. Now, Satan's not a dragon. He's not a red dragon. There's symbolism there. But the literal truth of who he is is there. For instance, when he, uh, 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 you, you look at that symbolism, you find out that a third of those uh, stars that he knocks out of the sky is a third of the angels that fell and became demon powers, spirits. And we, say, we see Satan characterized this way because of his ferocity, his cruelty, his power, his might. And when we understand that, that this symbolizes the devil, we believe in a literal existence of a devil. A lot of people don't believe in it, but the devil is real. And he rages in cruelty. And uh, figuratively speaking, he spits the fires of hate and hell at God's creation, at God's people. You don't do like some and say, oh, that's symbolism. Uh, I don't believe that. There's nothing to it. Uh, just throw this book away. God put it there in symbolism so that when you study it, it's kind of hidden there 
for, for those that walk with him and have his spirit to be illuminated to show us Jesus and to show us truths that are, that are end time truths. So we see not only the central character uh, is Jesus Christ of the book of Revelation, but we also see the clear purpose, which is to reveal the future, the sureness of it, the nearness of it, and to let us see the signs, both symbolically but have literal truth, a symbolic, symbolic language that has literal truth to it. The third thing we see is the comforting promise that's in this book of Revelation. Look at verse 2 and 3 again. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth. There's the promise. You'll be blessed to read. And they that hear, blessed if you hear the words of this prophecy. You'll be blessed. And keep those things which are written therein. Blessed for the time is at hand. You see, you read, you hear, and you keep. There's three things in that verse 3. Hear, read. You read, you hear, you keep it. If you will saturate yourself with this book, you'll be blessed. You may not understand everything, but, but read it. There'll be a feeling of something to come to you until it's God's Word, and it's all good. And uh, some of you have never read the whole Word of God. I urge you, I challenge you to do it. You'll be blessed just by reading it. And, you know, if it doesn't do anything else for you, it, it'll, 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 it'll scare the daylights out of you, right? So... Even if you don't understand it, I believe that it'll be a blessing to you. You'll see the greatness. You'll see the grandeur of God. You'll see the future. You'll see that God has the last chapter written. You'll see that God is in control. You'll see the symbols and the signs and the awesome wonder of it all. So read it, but also heed it. Heed it, which means hear it. Hear it. In verse 3, hear the word means to watch over. We say, children, did you hear me? They're not talking about did it go in your ear and you actually heard the audible words. You're talking about did you like really listen, take that thing into your heart. You don't just read it, you hear it, you hear it, you heed it. You, you, you step up and do something about it. It's important. It matters. And so, uh, you see, we, we need both prophetic doctrine and practical duty working side by side. We need to understand prophetic doctrine, but we need practical duty, and they're always to be linked together. The real sign of whether you believe or heed this book is how you take no not how you take notes, it, but how you warn people and take heed to get ready for the wrath to come. The real thing is not like I love to look at end time events and I love to study this whole thing but if it's not causing you he said he that has this hope purifies himself if it's not causing you to, to be more pure and it's ca causing an urgency to share the gospel before the end time comes then you've missed the point I, I, I hope the end of the study of revelation and prophecy doesn't cause your head to be in the clouds of prophecy but causes your feet to be on the pavement the soul winning and so this is going to be a test whether you heed these things. So uh, you need to live close to Jesus. Someone said if, if you keep your head when everyone else around you is losing theirs, it's a sign you don't understand. <laughs> you don't understand the situation. Or maybe you really do understand the situation and you understand God is in control. I don't know how many times I've seen people panicking like crazy and I'm going, okay. I know the end, I know the last chapter. I know, I know what happens. You know, the Yankees may be behind the Red Sox now, but it isn't going to end that way. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in. You know that God's in control because you studied God's Word, and it's clear. There's no other book that can bless you like God's Word. When you read it, you hear it, you heed it, you keep it, right? It's the book of God. Do you have a science book? It doesn't bless you. Science books don't bless you. Science has made the world a, neighbor, a, a, a neighborhood, but not a brotherhood. You know, we're, we're in graduate school scientifically, but we're in kindergarten morally. Somebody described civilization, you know, this was a great quote, as a chimpanzee without a blowtorch in a room full of dynamite. As a chimpanzee with a blowtorch, or rather, in a room full of dynamite. There's no blessing in the book of science. There's no blessing in the, in the political manual, and there's no point in me even commenting. You know that. That's two-year-old stuff. No blessing in a political manual. In the book of sociology, there's no blessing. Uh, their answers are like painting the, dicks, the decks of a, of a, of a, of a, 
a, a, a, a, a, a, a, a, a sinking ship? What is wrong with my mouth? Like painting the decks of a, a sinking ship. That's a pretty good picture. Sociology won't do a thing for you. Things are just getting worse. The blessing is in the second coming of Jesus Christ, and we have to keep our eyes up, uh, upward and onward and in faith and in hope. As we saw these things to come to pass, we don't have to be shaken. We know God's word. and We see prophecy come into pass. We can say, praise God, he's coming soon. When things begin to come to pass, then lift up your heads, your redemption draweth nigh, right? Look to the eastern sky. That's what the Bible says. Jesus is coming. So how are you going to have this kind of blessing? We must know this book. Uh, the day, the Bible says, will not come, overcome you as a thief. Your eyes will be wide open. You see it. Read it. Heed it. Keep it. Keep it. There's a comforting promise in the book. You might say, Pastor Weaver, you're a nut. So I'm, I, I know, but I'm fastened to a good bolt, and it'll be okay. So, so remember this. Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee, right? The big storm comes up, and they're wondering what in the world's going on. He's down taking a little nap, you know, and there's lightning, and there's wind. And they say, do something, Jesus. And Jesus says, peace be still. That's exactly in our world. There is craziness going on that I'll get to in a minute. Our world's in a storm. And it's going to get worse until the Jesus, who is, who is the Prince of Peace, comes and says, Peace be still. Scripture says, As the lightning shines from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, lightning starts when a storm comes. Storms come from the west to the east, right? So when the storm blew through today in the rain early this morning, it didn't rain long, and the wind was blowing, and the rain came pretty hard just a short time, and it went by. And if there was any lightning, it was, it was in the east. We'd look to the east. But when it's gone, you look to the west. So what is it saying? As the lightning shines from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is going to come the eastern skies, right? He's coming. It means the storm will be over when he comes because then we'll be gone. And, and, and for us, the storm is over. For those on earth, it's just beginning. But it's when it's shining from the east to the west, it means the storm is over. Jesus will say, peace be still, comfort one another with these words you see in all prophetic books. You see, comfort one another, comfort one another, comfort one another. Why? That Jesus wins. That heaven is ours. That no matter what they do to us, that we have a heavenly home. You don't have to worry. See, I don't believe Christians should be afraid of end time events, of all the craziness going on. We don't need to be afraid. There's no point. So keep your eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, who is the Prince of Peace. The central character is Jesus. The clear purpose is to reveal the future, to show us of the things that are come. And, uh, and then the, there's a comforting promise of being blessed by reading and, and heeding and keeping this book. And, and, uh, and then the last thing is the certain prophecy of the book. The time is at hand, verse 3 says, the last verses. The time is at hand. That doesn't mean, oh, it's right then. No. What time is he talking about? The second coming of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus says the time is at hand, he doesn't mean immediately, but the imminent return of Jesus, which means from the day John wrote this until now, he could have come any time. Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, he can't come yet. This has to happen. That has to happen. This has to happen. That is not what the Bible teaches. That's not what the disciples believe. They were looking, imminent returns mean he can come any time. All right? And if it was close then, you know it's closer now, right? Uh, and so uh, it's nearer now than it was yesterday. You remember the old song, signs of the time are everywhere. There's a brand new feeling in the air. Lift your eyes upon the eastern sky. Lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. Sign me up, right? Signs of the time, we see them. And some of those signs is Israel becoming a nation in May of 48. I mean, we forgot that. Remember the crazy book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 88? And then he missed it, 89 Reasons Why He's Going to Come in 89. Because he's selling books, right? Nobody knows the day or the hour. We see the signs that are around us, and they've been there for a while, and they're still there. And I'm telling you, it's closer than it's ever been. And we need to heed that and not, not turn a deaf ear to it because the church is going to go to sleep, those that are in the light, and they're not going to be watching for its coming. Our word on our mouth should be Maranatha. Jesus is coming. Maranatha. So this is a, a significant sign of his coming. Matthew 24, 32. When you see the fig tree blooming, know that this is on your doorstep. Israel became a nation. It's clear. 
and then Russia's rise in power in the world. Read Ezekiel 38, 15, and 16. You see it right there, talking about the people from the north war, warring against God's people. And I'm telling you, I, don't, I know there's crazy stuff going on. I don't even understand everything in the news. And quite honestly, I don't even care. They're crazy. I'll let the people that study all the, the, the current events and to tie it into pro prophecy do that. But I'm telling you, Russia, most biblical scholars believe that Russia is going to come against and, uh, Israel. And, but they're, they're going to be sorely disappointed when it happens because we know the rest of the story. And so, yeah, this vision of an army from the north of Israel that is going to invade in the last days. So, and then there's, there's going to be some sort of, we don't know exactly what this was. At one time, we thought it might, might be the, um, you know, the common market. Oh, I don't know about that. But there's, there's supposed to be a 10-nation confederacy. Well, here's what's significant about our day today is that this, you know, they say the world is small. Nations gather together and world leaders gather together. And we don't know what that'll look like, but get ready because it's, it's in place and it's spoken of, of this uh, uh, 10-nation confederacy in Revelation 17 and Daniel 2. So, and then there's the rise of the occult. I mean, in Europe, I mean, you, can't, you cannot believe how many Satanists there are. And they'll have cer many ceremonies a year where they pledge devotion to Satan. There's so much of the occult and demonism, it's unreal. 1 Timothy 4.1 talks about the last days. It says, now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter days, latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And I'm telling you, there's book, bookstores with just loads of books on witchcraft and astrology and voodoo and horoscopes and magic and reincarnation, ESP, all kinds of stuff being taught, some of it in, 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 in colleges around our nation uh, and, and even some public schools. And, you know, uh, so just, just watch that. The rise of the occult's another marker. The great increase in earthquakes and natural disasters. Oh, my goodness. Can we not see floods, earthquakes, volcanoes, fires, pestilence. Uh, it's, it's just, it's, it's totally unprecedented. And, uh, and so if you, you know, as the earth shakes, as the Bible says, the end time, he'll shake everything that can be shaken so that only the standing on Jesus Christ will stand. And as the, 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 the earth shakes, there is a rock that you can stand on. That's the rock of ages, and his name is Jesus Christ, the central rock person of this Bible. And then there's the increase in famine and pestilences. The black horse of tribulation, famine, is getting ready to ride. You know, people are starving all over the world every day. People die. America sends a lot, but a lot of countries are very corrupt. The, the, people, the common people don't get the food. Sudan, starvation in Haiti, Somalia, Cambodia, Vietnam, Ethiopia, Bosnia, Angola, Liberia, it's pockets of civilization all over the world. And what we have in America is very uncommon, not common to the rest of the world. Even other, even other uh, countries that are more civilized, their, foods, their food, uh, how they eat and their food supply is not like it is here. And so it, it is definitely a sign, and, and it's going to come to pass as we see the environment changing. Whatever's happening, there's a whole lot more like, uh, um, uh, what are those called that come off the hurricanes and I mean, you, every kind of natural disaster you can think of has just been peaked, has it not? We're going sometime in September to up in Yellowstone, and there's something up in there. They're saying it could just blow, you know, and I mentioned in a Sunday morning uh, not long ago that they say that two-thirds of the United States, I think it was two-thirds or a third, could be absolutely covered with lava, just like an eruption. There's an eruption that, that could happen at any time, and we're wiped out. Right? I don't know where it's not going to happen, but I am thinking about retiring there uh, when, I, <laughs> when I reach about 80. So I'm going to be careful what I say, Don, because I don't want to go out on a railroad, you know. So uh, uh, anyway, then peace talks. And, uh, you know, we see those happening as we're, you know, not so much right now, but, <laughs> you know, it's going to happen. And I, I close with this, with, this, uh, with this scripture, and let me just say this. Have you ever heard of Russian roulette? You put the one bullet in the thing and spin the barrel, and psh, play that, spin the barrel, psh, and if you happen to hit the wrong bullet and hole, it's going to hit you, right? Right? A lot of people play rapture roulette. 
They're kind of playing a game, thinking, well, he's not going to come. He's not going to come. Let me tell you, the trumpet's going to sound. The angel's going to shout. The Lord is going to appear. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ will rise first. And those of us that are alive in Christ and waiting and watching, that walking with Jesus, we're going to rise up to meet him. And I I know there's a lot of teaching about a lot of things. But this book, besides the whole arguing about when Jesus is going to come, pre-trib, mid-trib, post-tribulation, all that. This book is rich in so much more, this book of Revelation, and it's worth a read. It's worth a read. Um, so here's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I close, close with this, and this ought to awaken you if you're asleep, um, in spiritually sleeping. I was going to read this off the screen. Chapter 5. Starting in verse uh, 1. But of the times and of the seasons, brothers, you have no need that I write to you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say shall, for when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. But you, brothers, are not in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief. You are all children of light and children of the day. We're not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The book, The Revelation of Jesus Christ, is revealing a time of seven years called the Great Tribulation. It's the wrath of God and judgment upon those that are not following Christ. And we don't want to be here, and I don't believe I'm going to be. Who died for us? Okay, so God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we're alive or dead, in other words, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. And there it is again, comfort. So what's the blessing of the book? Reading it, studying it, knowing it. It brings comfort to you. It motivates you to be a witness. It motivates you to stay pure. And so to live right, because Jesus is coming back, and it's not he might come back. It's not, you know, if he's going to come back. It's when he's going to come back. And only the Father knows. And he'll send his son. And it'll happen. And it'll be when, the, when if you're not looking, you're going to get caught off guard. I mean, let me ask an honest question for all you holy rollers. How often do you get up and think this could be the day Jesus comes? Do you have that thought? Jesus could come the day. I'm watching and waiting and expecting. My heart is ready. See, that's what the Word of God teaches us to do. Watch and be ready. End times are near. Next week we'll take a look at Jesus Christ described right here in Revelation. Um, himself, Jesus. And uh, he's described. And uh, boy, when he comes again, he's coming with great power. He's coming as a, a judge. He's coming with his might and fullness. And, uh, and so I, 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 I want to be, I want, when he comes, boy, I want to be ready. Don't you? Right? Okay, are you ready?